Uh, before I distribute it, I will first provide you with a general feedback on the basis of the overall results of your assignments. Now, I would like to emphasize that we reflect honestly on successes and failures, and that is one of the strong principles we apply in our tutorial. To work with people coming from different backgrounds, bringing their different views and different experiences and different perspectives. And I think also for educational environment that is very enriching. We provide the same opportunities for students who are in The Hague as for students who are elsewhere in the world. Apply equality and inclusivity as basic values. As well as take small steps in order to achieve our goals. Fortunately enough, um, The Hague University has actually prepared me for these type of crises, learning how to adapt and to overcome and to be flexible in my thinking and to make sure that um, I am able to shift with the changes um, that are happening in the outside world. And because of that, the Hague University of Applied Sciences has given me a shared ethical awareness and clarity about our actions towards students, colleagues, and the outside world. During the global pandemic, you're seeing courage uh, in everyday things every day, um, particularly within the university environment for students that are having to take public transit to come to, come to the university. That shows a great amount of courage in my view. The corona situation has impacted my personal hobbies in tremendous ways. As a rugby player outside of university, I do it to impact my own physical fitness, to keep a social life going outside of my program, and it has been tremendously uprooted by the quarantine and the lockdown that's been imposed on us. Matches have been cancelled and the season has been put on hold. But I'm hopeful the corona is going to go away and I'm coping. There's no reason this can't be the same for everybody else. When I have an online moment with a group, I don't need to go over the theory one more time, but rather I can use my time with them to maximize that contact and actually have discussions on practical events, case studies, which I think is really useful and beneficial for, for both sides because it engages both parties, lecturers and students alike. Show ownership for your work and take responsibility for this both online and in-person moments. And uh, in the online moments, uh, we uh, discuss uh, uh, the topic uh, in more detail. And then in the in-person classes, uh, we uh, give the students the chance to practice it. And we also uh, walk around and give feedback. What we do essentially is that uh, we test the knowledge of the students during the in-person classes, because we think that when we work in smaller groups, it's easier to, to give feedback. Care. One of the core values at the Hague University is care. It is reflected in the way that or activities are organized in our program as well as in extracurricular activities such as the E&E. Connect. The Hague University of Applied Sciences embodies the value of connection from the first year. In the first year, students from all over the world and from different countries and continents come together and connect in order to study international and European law. Curiosity. The Hague University of Applied Sciences really embodies curiosity in e, e As a first year student, we have never had the opportunity of meeting professionals before. Professional. Engage. And open. Work together evolve and achieve change in the process. Our research focus area is refugee law, but we're doing refugee law with an environmental impact. So we're talking about how refugees have to um, immigrate and go to other countries due to environmental impact in their country. And being online, I find that I am more able to quickly reference material on my laptop. I can just swipe between screens. I can look things up and I can more accurately uh, substance my arguments with reference to the material. What we want is to make sure that uh, we we are all working towards uh, establishing networks which were not in place uh, before, uh, let's say, this pandemic, uh, because we have access now to persons who live very far from the Netherlands and they can still talk to our students or 
intervene in some class, in some events. Financially, it costs uh, much less uh, to, to ask them to travel uh, to the Netherlands. So for this reason, in order to set up a meeting, an event with persons who live very far, it doesn't take a lot of efforts as long as we have the right connection. Let's change you as the world. Good day, ladies and gentlemen, respective guests, valued students, and colleagues. Welcome to the Ceremony of Employment Network event 2020, the ninth edition from The Hague, Netherlands. My name is Mira Veni Sibog Montero, an alumna and now a lecturer of international and EU law at The Hague University of Applied Sciences. I had the pleasure to attend the very first Employment Network event in 2012, and now, it is my pleasure to be your master of ceremony in today's event. Considering the safety of everyone, for the first time, we are conducting the Employment Network event online. We are therefore grateful to our guests, colleagues, and students in helping us complete this event so everyone can watch it around the world. To our students, we wish you all the best in adopting to the notion of the new normal. To our guest universities, may you get to know more about the Hague University students faculty members, and our prestigious speakers. To the respective employers, may we still contribute to your activities remotely. And to our alumni, on behalf of the law program, we are sending our warm greetings to all of you in 65 countries. Today, we will start with some few words from our Dean Lidwin Bremer, followed by three interviews conducted by our students with high officials of the European Union on very relevant topics of 2020 and two alumni talking about their successful careers. Now, I would like to give the floor to our beloved Dean, who is responsible for the Faculty of Public Management, Law and Safety, Lidwin Bremer. Good afternoon. I'm very pleased and honored to be able to be part of the ceremony of the ninth edition of the Employer Network event of the International and European Law Program of the Hague University of Applied Sciences. I'm Lidwin Bremer, I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Public Management, Law and Safety, in which this program is uh, housed. And I'm particularly proud that the program has been able to conduct this event today online. Due to the COVID restrictions, we are having to conduct it online. And I must say, I miss a bit being able to address a live audience. And in particular, I now miss already not being able, after the ceremony, to go and mingle with all the guests in the atrium and to watch everybody chatting animatedly. You can imagine how this wonderful space, how this wonderful space normally at an employer network event is really filled and overcrowded with, uh, with people with employers, with institutions presenting their master's programs, with our alumni, with our students and lecturers. This entire space 
full with full of aficionados. From the entrance of the building to the steps heading towards the Lord territory. The innovation playground. The restaurant. And our speaker's corner on this side and inside the red column. The Ola, where we normally have the ceremony. But still, in a way it's consistent because the law program has been able over the years already to conduct these ceremonies, including video messages from alumni all around the world. Because this event is an employer network event, it's aimed at employers at other universities offering graduate studies, at our students, our lecturers and our alumni. And all of these people come from around the globe. Really recent additions to the team include Brazil, uh, South Africa and Poland, but there are I think over 40 nationalities represented within the program and students and staff. The great thing about the International Law Program is its applied focus. And this is so important in these days. 2020 has been a year impacting the world in ways unprecedented. We have seen Black Lives Matter. We have seen the first corona wave with a big impact on actual social cohesion. We have, of course, seen corona with a big impact on uh, economies, also on the climate. We have seen changes in democracies and the rule of law in countries such as the US and Poland. So these are challenging times. These are important times. And I think this really proves the importance and the continued relevance of the International and European Law Programme. Being an applied programme, we focus on the actual relevance. We focus on training our students in such a way that they are able to provide service to their employers from the very first day of their first contract. We call that hit the ground running. We want our trainer graduates to hit the ground running. And we do that, for instance, by a very extensive skills program, which is, I think, unprecedented, maybe even worldwide. We have very good people here on board. At this applied focus, we're making uh, strengthening even further right now because of um, uh, by including uh, an applied element in the graduation project in the graduation phase of the program meaning that all graduates will work on actual real-life cases and developing uh, ways and means to solve those problems, thereby underlining their importance to the employers being able to hit the ground running. We're adapting the program all the time to take uh, into account the new developments. We're including modules on gender and diversity, on global awareness, and uh, we're developing a compliance and ethics course, which has just gone live last, uh, last month. Very important work on also looking at the ethical side of the rule of law. I would like to conclude this talk by giving a special word of encouragement to our students. I think you are doing such a great job. The lecturer's teams has worked very hard to uh, develop all the education online, to pre pre present courses online and also the exams. And for students, this has been so hard to adapt. And you are doing such a great job adapting. Sometimes in circumstances with bad Wi-Fi, maybe not a quiet place to study. So I really appreciate all the hard work and the effort you are putting in. And I hope you ten can take courage from the, thing, from the thoughts that by doing this, you're developing such a resilience, being able to cope with unexpected events. This will be a really major asset for you, for your professional career in future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dean Bremer. Now, I would like to give the floor to our keynote speaker to share with us the role of Europol and some actions project on cooperation of police forces in Europe. Ladies and gentlemen, the president of Europol here in The Hague, Ms. Catherine de Ball. Students, alumni, teachers and professors, 
I am very pleased to have the opportunity to address a new generation of talent, a generation that will determine the course of, the, of our future. The future entrepreneurs, legislators, judges, law enforcement officials, policy makers and leaders. Many of the alumni attending this event may already be advanced in their careers. Others are working hard on achieving their dreams. A couple of alumni from your university are now working at Europol, perhaps participating in this event, and many more have done internships here. I would like to begin by putting Europol in its context, that is, the prevailing threats to our security posed by terrorism and organized crime. I will then talk about Europol's response to these threats, what it does and how it does it, and its place in the European security architecture. And finally, I will talk about the future of the agency. So, how does Europol respond to these threats? What do we actually do at Europol? Europol is the EU's law enforcement agency. Its mission is to support member states in preventing and combating all forms of serious and organized crime, cybercrime and terrorism. To ensure that the agency can deliver on this mission, I have defined five strategic priorities in the Europol strategy 2020 plus. Namely for Europol, be the EU criminal information hub. Deliver agile operational support to national investigations. Be a platform for European policing solutions. Be at the forefront of law enforcement innovation and research. And be the model EU law enforcement organization with robust performance, good governance and accountability. You could see Europol as a toolbox that complements national law enforcement capabilities and fills gaps. Europol develops innovative tools and techniques that it puts at the disposal of member states. We tailor our support to the member states' needs. Where member states lack technical or analytical capabilities, Europol has them. Should that not be the case, we will develop them, provided we are given sufficient resources to do so. This is more effective and efficient than each country developing its own tools and expertise. Key tools in this toolbox include a communication platform called Siena for secure and fast transmission of data from investigations between more than 14,000 competent authorities in 50 countries. More than a million messages are exchanged per year. An operational center operating 24-7. Databases of information for investigations against which we can cross-check data we receive, find links between investigations and provide investigative leads. We provide operational support to investigators, both from our headquarters and on the ground during operational actions. We assist by coordinating actions and host operational meetings. Analysis is at the core of our operational support. Europol's analysts also help investigators by improving the overall intelligence picture identifying modus operandi and new trends. We have expertise in various areas, be it in extracting data from seized mobile devices, in forensic or in dismantling drugs and counterfeit labs. These are just some of Europol's capabilities. I also had to make some adjustments to the structure of the agency to make it fit for pur purpose and future proof. In addition to the European Counterterrorism Center, the Cybercrime Center, the European Orga Serious and Organized Crime Center, Europol has a new European Center for Financial and Economic Crime to support member states with complex 
financial and economic crime investigation. Europol recently also set up an innovation lab. We are supporting successful investigations on a daily basis. Our support to several of the terrorist cases has been substantial. The creation of the European Counterterrorism Center in 2016 was a real game changer. A recent example of its work is when Spain, at the end of October, took down a terrorist cell suspected of indoctrinating and recruiting young people online for IS. Europol supported this investigation with long-term analytical and operational support. This was only one of numerous terrorism investigations and operations in several countries supporting, supported by Europol. A joint action day against child traffickers in October resulted in 388 arrests and the identification of 249 potential victims of human trafficking. The action day involved 12 countries. Europol coordinated the action, facilitated real-time information exchange, provided analysis and 24-7 operational support. You may also have heard about the EncroChat case, an encrypted phone network used by organized crime groups around the world, which was dismantled. Europol supported French and Dutch colleagues with the investigation. We intercepted information exchanges between criminals for many months and got unprecedented insight into criminal activities. So far, the investigation has led to the arrest of more than 100 suspects, seizure of drugs, weapons, cars, watches and 20 million euro in cash. And this is only the beginning. This operation will have sent shockwaves through organized crime communities around the globe. Now a few words on the larger picture. Europol is firmly anchored in the Europe's security architecture. The evolving, fluid and complex terrorist and organized crime threats call for a joint response from Europol and national law enforcement agencies. This response needs to entail a consolidation of established cooperation, full use of available tools and platforms and maximizing new opportunities for cooperation. The new EU Security Union strategy calls for a comprehensive set of measures to strengthen the legal and operational framework, including a revision of Europol's mandate. That is good. Europol has evolved over the years. It is confronted with many new challenges and many at many different levels. It has new tasks. These should be reflected in its legal regime. I therefore welcome these discussions. We need to reflect on the role of Europol as a service provider to the whole European law enforcement community. We need to ensure that our external relations regime, which is the framework for our cooperation with third countries, is effective and fits the purpose. The challenges, the challenges in the cyber area, an arena for organized crime and terrorists alike, calls for cooperation with private parties, like the service providers, like the financial institutions, and for Europol to be able to process large data sets. This too needs to be clear. At their meeting in October, the EU Home Affairs Ministers identified 10 points of importance for the future of Europol. They subscribed to the genuine added value of Europol for Europe and to Europol being a partner with a support function as the hub for criminal information exchange, analysis and expertise. The development of Europol should focus on the strengthening of these core tasks and the agency be provided appropriate and future-oriented resources. The ministers agreed 
that a global dimension of many types of crime requires cooperation between Europol and established actors in Europe and globally, thus anchoring Europol also in the global security architecture. I was encouraged by the Minister's support for the EU Innovation Hub located at Europol and for the agency's role in harnessing the potential of technological innovation and development. The ministers also raised several important aspects of the forthcoming recast of the Europol regulation. This will strengthen the agency in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, students and alumni, with these words of support of the Home Affairs Ministers of the EU, I am about to end this presentation. I hope I have provided you with an insight into Europol's work, challenges and future. And that some of you may even be inspired to pursue a career in law enforcement. It is a demanding but rewarding career. I have not regretted my career for one second. To have the opportunity to work with my outstanding colleagues at Europol and in the Member States with a joint mission to make Europe safer, this is a true privilege. Thank you. It's an event, fortunately, we wanted to, to, to have with you in the building of the university, in The Hague. Unfortunately, uh, we have to do it online, but, uh, but we are extremely grateful about this uh, possibility for our students. All the students that you can see and my colleagues uh, are very familiar with criminal law, with uh, questions of police, uh, myself a bit less, but, uh, but it's uh, for all of them uh, an opportunity that they will remember for a long time, certainly. So, um, so just a short introduction for myself. I'm uh, Aurélien Laurent, I'm senior lecturer, I'm the organizer of uh, this event. And uh, with my colleagues, uh, we teach international law and European law, and uh, including, of course, uh, European criminal law, international criminal law. And uh, on your side, uh, you are uh, the executive director of uh, Europol uh, since May 2018. Uh, before you had a long career in Belgium in police and as well in gendarmerie, military police. Uh, you have been chairing several, I would say, authorities in Belgium and uh, until, of course, you start participating in a lot of cooperation in the field of police uh, in Europe. And uh, you hello. are... Hi. Hello, yes. Yes, this is my colleague, Dr. Gatti. Uh, hello, Maro. And uh, to continue with your, uh, your uh, as well, uh, uh, long history in the field of uh, security, um, as well, you are as well an officier de la Légion d'honneur uh, in France, uh, which is the highest civilian honor uh, that we have. Um, and, uh, and so forth, it's an honor that we can uh, have a discussion with you on several discussions. Maybe I can now give the floor to my colleagues and students to introduce themselves. Maybe Miss Dezekel. Hi, good afternoon, Mr. Ball. I hope you can hear me well. I'm Chloe Dezekel. I'm one of the lecturers for the program at the Hague University. And I'm specialized in criminology, so it's a great pleasure to, to meet you and have this opportunity to talk with you today. Um, I, I've been working at The Hague University for nearly three years and I'm teaching mainly uh, legal skills but also criminal law uh, for year one and year two. So uh, I'm looking forward to our conversation. Thank you so much. You're working in the University of Mauro? Hi. Uh, shall I introduce myself briefly? Yes. Okay, yeah, I am an assistant professor at the University of Bologna. I used to teach as a lecturer at the Hague University of Applied Sciences. Uh, I'm still teaching there actually as a um, 
as an external lecturer, uh, and yeah, I work on European Union law, so different aspects of European Union law, including EU criminal law. Thank you. Ms. Birka. Thank you. Hello, uh, Executive Director De Bol. It's a pleasure to have you here and to be able to interview you. My name is Maranda Burka. I am a first year law student at The Hague University. And being very passionate about criminal law, this opportunity is amazing for me. So I'm looking forward to asking you a question. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Mir Ms. Muntanu? Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Maruna Montanu. I'm Romanian and I'm 19 years old. I'm studying as my colleague Law and I'm looking forward for the interview today. Thank you. Ms. Von Tönenbroek. Thank you. Good uh, afternoon, everyone. My name is Lotte von Tönenbroek. I'm a fourth year student at the International Law Program. I specialize in international criminal law and I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Motomayor. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you, Ms. Seville, for taking the time to talk to us. My name is Anna Mopemayor, and I'm a third year student of international law, and I'm really looking forward to meeting you. Thank you. Ms. Sarban. Good afternoon. My name is Alexander Sharban. Um, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be here and interview you. Uh, I'm currently a year um, two student, and I am looking forward to specialize in European criminal law. Thank you. And we have as well another student, but she's finishing an exam at this moment, Ms. Fondi. So, of course, uh, students are very much interested in your career, uh, obviously. So maybe we could start with a first question about it with maybe Ms. Van Tenenbroek. Yes. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is interview relates to the Employment Network event of our law program. Can you tell us something about one of the biggest challenges that you had to face regarding your career? Uh, thank you and good afternoon, uh, everybody. It's an honor for me uh, to be interviewed by, uh, by you. And I hope uh, you will get out uh, some inspiration for the future. Uh, the big challenge for my ca career was uh, when I was still a Commissioner General of the Federal Police in Belgium. And uh, we had uh, the attacks in um, uh, 2016. Um, then the challenge was how to prevent other attacks in the country. And um, how uh, can we um, maintain the trust of the public in the police forces? And we had also uh, police staff injured uh, severely by the attacks. So uh, we had to take care of them too, because the colleagues uh, were a bit afraid and were shocked by the events, because it was the first time in our lives that we were, um, f uh, that we were looking at uh, perpetrators that uh, were not afraid to lose their lives because of their ideology. And uh, this was completely new for us, because normally the special forces, it's uh, the, the most trained, uh, strong police officers in, in, in your organization, when they come, it's the last phase of a police intervention, and normally they surrender uh, the perpetrators. But in this case, it was not the case. Uh, our policemen and women became also victim, and uh, we had a lot of, of injuries. So, and that was a very challenging period because I could not show my emotions. I had to take care of the whole of the force. At police, we work with uh, uh, psychological people. We work with a stress team. Um, we also take care of the families of the, of the policemen and women. So we had to take uh, this all into account to make sure that we could rely on them, that, that on them uh, we could continue to rely on them. The whole of the society needed to rely on them. Um, we need uh, to prevent uh, attacks and uh, we needed uh, to keep uh, the trust. And it was after a long period that I was able to allow myself to feel. <laughs> that was the most challenging period until now. Thank you. Uh, so next question would be from another student, which is indeed about the work of Europol and as well uh, how to, to get recruited. Uh, maybe Ms. Birka? 
Yes, thank you. Uh, bearing in mind that I am very passionate, as I said, about uh, criminal law, and I'm sure that other students would be really interested to know this as well. Uh, what would make a potential candidate stand out and be recruited or even accepted to work at Europol? Uh, working at Europol is for a lot of people a dream and it is a, a wonderful organization because you can serve a society and you can try to build on a, on a safer society. And uh, we have a lot of applicants, but most of our people uh, come from the law enforcement community because they, we are uh, responsible um, to support member states in the field of serious and organized crime and terrorism. So they have uh, they need to have experience is, as a law enforcement officer uh, to, before they can uh, work here. So uh, we look for people who speak English, and it, it's not uh, so obvious in, uh, for, for each police officer. We look for people who are able to work in a, in a diverse community. Uh, because we are one European Union, but you see differences between the, um, the different member states in, in, in the country, in, in uh, the European Union. We also look for creative people and for innovative people who have a bit of vision about the future and how to deal with crime and how to find the right answers for the future. So you need a mixture of good investigators and innovators and you have to bring them together. And um, when we talk about operations and the management of Europol, you need to have experience in a national law enforcement agency. Um, when we talk, for instance, about uh, the innovation lab we just uh, set up, about the governance of the uh, agency, about uh, tasks related to finances or related to um, to HR, then everybody can apply for a position at Europol. But it, it will have to be the same. Uh, we, do, we do not look for the same um, uh, people, but they have to be innovative. They have to be um, very known and they have to be able to work in this uh, multicultural environment. And they also have to be sure, we have to be sure that they are able uh, to continue to learn because uh, if you work here, um, the member states, they ask uh, very high level specialized support from our side. So we have to be the best in everything what we do. And we have to, be, to invent a lot of things and to, um, uh, to offer uh, strategic reports on trends in, in criminality and so. So we need people who can do that. And that is what we are looking for. Thank you so much. Thank you. Maybe. Yes, okay, I got it. Thank you so much. I wasn't sure you were talking to me. Um, so um, my question for you, Ms. Double, is according to the data published on the Europol website, I saw that 34% of all Europol staff members, um, law enforcement and civilians combined are women and only 0.5% of those are in middle or senior management. Yet we know that in a law enforcement environment, gender balance has added benefits. So how do you explain this low percentage and how can we encourage more women to help make Europe a safer place for all? Yes, the data uh, are not right. We have 20% of women in the management positions at the moment. When I arrived in 2018, I made a real issue of it. And um, I visited all the police chiefs in all the member states of the European Union. And I was very vocal on the fact that they should send good female candidates too. And uh, we see that now more uh, female candidates are applying for the jobs and they are very well ranked uh, during the selection procedures. So we, uh, we have now 20% uh, women in, um, in management positions, head of unit, head of department, or then the overall directorate where we are four, uh, the director and the deputy directors and 25% is already a woman, but also in the other levels, 
head of department and head of unit, uh, we have more women. We have a specific program for that uh, implemented in the organization since I arrived. Uh, for instance, when we held uh, selection committees, we need, uh, there is an obligation uh, to have women in the selection committees. Because um, I experienced this already my whole life. It gives another dynamic to the discussions in a selection committee. We have a, a policy that every new policy uh, we launch in the agency needs to be gender neutral. And we look really carefully to the wording of the policies we use. So we have a, a diversity group men, women, it's not only about uh, gender, it's also about um, the LGBTQ uh, community. It's also about minorities uh, in different member states, like uh, the Roma minority, for instance, in Hungary. Um, we look at all types of diversity and we want to reach out uh, to all of them. So when we launch new policies, we also look um, at uh, the wording of the policies uh, to be sure that we are inclusive that, and that we can reach uh, the, the whole of the uh, police community and uh, the society. Um, we, um, uh, we have uh, this in our, um, in our overall strategy. We want to be the EU model uh, agency, uh, so diversity. Uh, and inclusion are really important to us, and, and we, uh, we put a lot of focus on that. Last year, we had uh, the first diversity day at Europol with uh, all types of minorities and uh, with a huge discussion and debate on law enforcement and minorities in law enforcement and how can we uh, do better and more for, uh, for women, for instance. What I experienced here at Europol is that when a man applies for a job at Europol, the, most of the time the, the wife she follows. When a wife, when a woman applies for a job at Europol, in a lot of cases, the woman has to come on her own and the husband stays at home because of his career. It's a big difference and that is what is hindering a lot of uh, mm -hmm. female applicants to apply for a position in this organization. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now a question as, as well concerning the mandate of Europol. Uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Gatti, what is the question? Yes, it is a rather technical question, to be honest, uh, regarding exactly what Europol does. Uh, its mandate evolved over the years from mainly information exchange to more operational tasks. Uh, do you think that uh, we can expect an evolution of Europol's mandate over the next few years, or is such evolution foreseeable or necessary? Or should it, Europol in particular be granted powers while the public would like coercive measures to have its own standing core, more or less like Frontex, for instance. The, the idea of Europol was born uh, 20 years ago by Helmut Kohl. And the proposal from Helmut Kohl was indeed to work with a kind of European FBI. This was not supported in the European Union. They wanted uh, to bring police officers together to work together. That was the first um, main goal to attempt on European level. And this is still our strength. We have in the office 260 liaison officers from 52 countries. And this is a very, very strong asset and it's unique in the world. You have um, a uh, Dutch police officer who can work together immediately with a colleague in a drugs uh, file, for instance, because they are in the same building. They can have their operational meetings immediately and the trust, which is very important in the law enforcement community, you can build really on the trust between people and this will help you to exchange information. And there I, am, I have the second big point for Europol, the exchange of information. If we do not exchange information on a European level, we are lost in the cases of serious and organized crime terrorism. It's key for police cooperation. That is why we are recognized now as the criminal information hub 
from for the European Union for the law enforcement community in the European Union. Uh, why uh, do we need this? We need this because then you need you have an overall perspective of what is going on on European level and even beyond. Coercive powers. We I don't think we need it. Because member states, it, the Lisbon Treaty is very clear. National security is a national competence. And um, the member states have their coercive powers. They need Europol to bring information together and to process data sets, small data sets or large data sets, so that we can offer to the member states new leads, which lead to new investigations and to links between the different countries. So, in fact, we are a platform bringing countries together, but we are also a criminal information hub which enriches the data and the information available in one member state with data and information from another member state or from a third country. Uh, when I visited the police chiefs uh, and when I talk uh, on a regular basis with uh, the law enforcement officers in the whole of the European Union, they really be believe that we have to remain an intelligence hub for policing that helps them in uh, solving the cases. And uh, therefore, we do not need uh, coercive powers. We have uh, guest experts. Uh, we have a project now, guest experts. And that is a bit inspired on Frontex. Why did we come to this project? It is in fact, uh, in some uh, countries, you do not have the possibility to have a lot of large scale investigations or you do not have a lot of murders, for instance. And, but you, knew, you need to have the expertise. So the aim of the project is to bring experts from different member states together on an ad hoc basis, and then uh, to uh, consider them as Europol staff, but to deploy them to the country that needs, that, that, is in, um, that has an expectation towards a super, uh, um, some kind of expertise field where they do not have uh, specialized uh, staff in. This is uh, something new. Regarding the legal framework, the European Commission is now working on a recast of the Europol regulation, but it is more to make the agency future proof to be able to give us the possibility to look into research and development, to look into innovation, to look in um, uh, large data sets, uh, to work uh, closer and have the possibility to work better together with third countries, with the private sector. But this, this is, uh, in fact, it's not a revolution for the agency. It is an evolution for the agency because when you talk about cybercrime, when you talk about financial crime, you have to be able to work with um, the private sector in these cases because they have a lot of data that is very useful for the law enforcement community. And so it's making the framework future proof, but it's not a revolution. We will not be a European FBI in the, the upcoming 10, 20, 30 years. Um, Ms. Mutamayor has a question uh, about you when you were a student and when you started your career. Thank you. Yeah, I would like to know um, if you would have one thing that you would recognize that you did or a decision that you took that most influenced the position that you got to have today. Um, what is very important uh, for me is uh, when I was a young professional um, that you recognize your strengths, but also your weaknesses and that you dare to, f to ask for advice and help. So I had some people not related to the law enforcement community, but uh, to have discussions with them and to have regular meetings with them to discuss about issues that uh, were important to me as a, a young police leader. Um, and I still have them until today. So they give me, in fact, insights and perspectives, also negative uh, feedback when needed, and I can learn from that. So I am, you, you need to be connected to the world. 
and you you need to understand what is going on in society and if you are only together with peers who do the same then you will not grow and you have to accept negative criticism towards you and towards uh, the way you perform and the decisions you take and you have to learn uh, out of that that was for me very important and it is a guiding principle uh, since the beginning of it has been a guiding principle since the beginning of my career Thank you. And a very nice question uh, from uh, Lotte van Tenenbroek, which is about the balance uh, between work uh, and, and, of course, having a social life. Could you give your question about it? Yes, thank you, Mr. Lawrence. Um, so, indeed, my question is about finding balance. Um, women who have a su successful career are constantly asked on how they balance life and work. Uh, I therefore hope that you can forgive me for asking, but I was wondering whether you can give some advice for me and other students who are wondering on how to become successful in their work field, but also maintaining a joyful social life. Yes, yeah. it is not an easy question. And ho the whole of my life, I have been asked uh, this question. And um, one of my advantages I had is that I have a husband uh, who want, who believed in me and in my career and who did uh, step aside because we didn't want, I have three children, we didn't want our children to be, lay, to be raised by other people than, than us. So my husband uh, is a half-time worker and uh, yes, I am more than full-time worker, but he takes care of everything that has to be done at home. Next to my husband, of course, we have a, a network, uh, we have a family, we have friends and we have neighbors uh, when we need help from them. But um, you win a, I am very happy with the job I do and I am very motivated. And every day I am inspired by the people around me because they have a lot of creative and innovative ideas and they really want to do something, they really want to catch the criminals and they really to want to do something really good uh, for society. So that is, uh, gives a lot of inspiration. On the other hand, you have to accept that you are not always there for your children, that you are not there on crucial moments. And yes, that is something you have to take, uh, you have to be able to cope with it. But it's the same for the man. When a man is a CEO of a company or a director in an agency or a university professor, he also has uh, a lot of obligations related to his job. And he also misses a lot of beautiful moments at home with the children. Um, but it's, it's uh, you, you have to try to find the right balance. You have to try to be there when you really need to be there and you have to be available. And that is a good thing in the digital world. You have a lot of possibilities to connect uh, with your family when they need you and to talk with your family uh, when uh, they need you. Um, but uh, if you have a job uh, on, on a high level, it's a lot of responsibilities. And uh, yes, you cannot have it all. You have to make choices and you have to be, uh, you have to accept these choices. And sometimes you regret moments and sometimes you are very happy. But um, overall, I am, I am very motivated and very happy. My children are very proud, but they do not want my life. That's what they say already yeah. right now. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. And uh, after COVID, we are an open house. You're always welcome. And I hope to see you uh, in real life uh, one day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Now, to share with us the importance of alternative dispute resolution in the European institutions, I would like to welcome our beloved colleagues, the lead lector, Dr. Barbara Borbas and Dr. Artemis Maliaropolo, who interviewed with our students the European Ombudsman speaking from Brussels.
Good afternoon, Miss. Good afternoon, Miss O'Reilly. Good Hi, afternoon. how are you? We are fine. We are fine. Uh, good afternoon from the Netherlands, from The Hague. Uh, thank you for accepting uh, this uh, discussion with our students uh, on the occasion of uh, our events that we have every year. And uh, this year, we are very happy to have you discussing with our students and colleagues, uh, especially because uh, they are specializing in uh, mediation, arbitration, alternative dispute resolution. Um, so uh, it's extremely, uh, I would say, an honor for us. Uh, as well, in fact, uh, we had a student from our university who worked with you in the past, uh, Fabio Gomez, it was his name, and, uh, and uh, he, he told me that it would be great indeed that uh, we can have this discussion, especially for the students who are targeting to work in this field. Um, so I would like to introduce myself and as well uh, my colleagues and students. Uh, my name is Ronia Lorange. I am French. Uh, I am the senior lecturer in EU Law in the university. I'm the organizer of this event. We have to help students to work, uh, to get internships, uh, and as well to network uh, simply. Um, and um, my colleagues as well uh, help me as well uh, and with the students to interview some, uh, I would say, uh, personalities who are extremely important as well for the European law, for as well uh, international law. For this reason, uh, yes, I would like to give the floor as well to my colleague, first colleague, to introduce herself, Dr. Uh, Barbara. Good afternoon, uh, Ms. O'Reilly, uh, all. Uh, my name is uh, Barbara Barbas. I am a lector professor in multi-level regulation and the director of the Center of Expertise on Global Governance at TUAS. Uh, in our research group and in our center, we investigate the role of alternative dispute resolution, ADR, in increasing public trust in regulatory actors such as the EU. Uh, we see ADR as an important tool to, uh, through which we can actually try to increase transparency, accountability and inclusiveness of contemporary multilevel regulation. So it's a pleasure for me to be here today and um, I look forward to our discussions and learning from you uh, on those topics and other topics together with students. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, th thank you. Thank you for that, that lovely welcome. I, I have to say, um, I, I know your university very well because my son graduated from there about three years ago. Oh. Um, and, and yes, indeed. And he's uh, in European studies. And he's now in, in, in Washington in a communications role. So um, uh, he's doing well so far. Uh, wow. And I remember actually speaking at your college uh, a few years ago while, while my son was still there. So uh, I have very fond memories of it. And I wish all of the students the, the very best uh, in, in, in uh, their future. Because certainly my son's experience was, was very positive and, uh, and he enjoyed it enormously. Um, so, look, I'm here to tell you about the small office of the European Ombudsman. Mm -hmm. um, some of you might not have been too aware of it. It's not like the Commission or the Council or the Parliament, which everybody has heard of. But to my mind, it's a very important office because our reach, our network, our work is right across the EU administration because our job is, according to the treaties and indeed the Charter of Fundamental Rights, uh, is to be the watchdog of the entire EU administration and to make sure that it does its work well, that it does its work fairly when it comes to dealing with citizens, businesses uh, and anybody else that has dealings with the EU. So therefore we work with the Commission, Parliament, Council, all of the regulatory agencies, the Court of Auditors, the European Medicines Agency, um, the ECJ, but in its administrative role, obviously not its judicial role, uh, and the Parliament also in its administrative role, and uh, but not not in its uh, political role as such. So what are we there to do? We're basically like any ombudsman, uh, and I know there's an excellent uh, ombudsman in in, in the Netherlands. Um, we're there to take essentially complaints if people believe they have been treated unfairly by the administration. Now, in most of the member states, a lot of those complaints have to do with the, the, the daily work or the daily lives of people, housing, social protection, pensions, health, education and so on. Now, obviously, most of those issues are competences of the member states. So when you make a complaint to me against the EU administration, the complaints are slightly different. 
So we might, for example, get a complaint from an environmental NGO uh, in relation to where to the way that uh, the Commission is dealing with complaints against uh, uh, an environmental complaint or some environmental issue that has emerged in a member state. We might get a complaint from a journalist because they have been denied access to a certain document. We may get a complaint uh, from a small business who perhaps failed to get a contract or a grant from an EU institution. Uh, we may get a complaint from uh, an NGO dealing in transparency, um, ethical issues in relation to what they might perceive as a conflict of interest. If, for example, a commissioner or a senior official has has moved to the private sector and the public interest has not been uh, has not been uh, fully protected, conflicts of interest, ethics, and so on, we might get a complaint from an NGO from a civil society organisation working, let's say, in Greece, in relation to how the EU agencies that are based uh, in 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 those Mediterranean countries are dealing with, you know, migration issues, asylum issues, and and so on. So as you can see, it's a hugely wide range of issues, and that's why I think the work that we do is, is really important and actually really interesting. If you are somebody who, like all of you, has an interest in the law, an interest in the EU, and are generally curious uh, about life and things and how things happen and how society works and how an administration uh, interacts uh, with, with the people. So my background is not in law, uh, it's in journalism, political journalism, but in a way, uh, the, what I'm doing now is not that different. I'm still in that same space between the people and the governments, the people and the administration, and making sure that the interaction between them uh, is fair. So the way that, that we, we, we do our work, let's say one of you people send in a uh, you're looking for a particular document in relation to a particular issue. You ask the Commission, can I have this record? They say no. You come to us, we look at the record, we decide whether it should be released or not, whether the Commission was correct in its interpretation. And then we make a recommendation. We're not like a court, we don't make a binding decision. So we make a recommendation which the institutions can decide to accept or not. But in the vast majority of cases, um, they, they do. Um, the, the ultimate power that we have is to take a report to the European Parliament uh, to get their support if a particular institution has, has failed to accept what we would consider to be a very important recommendation. We don't go running to the European Parliament every time we get a, a recommendation rejected. So the only one time in, in the seven years I've been uh, in office where I brought a recommendation uh, to a report to Parliament concerned the transparency of the Council. That is, all of the member states, all of our ministers who come to Brussels to make the laws. And this was in relation to the transparency of that process. In other words, do we know the position that the Netherlands or that Ireland is taking in relation to a particular, uh, a particular legislative uh, proposal? Can we see the documents that they use to inform themselves uh, about it? Um, so, because the Council um, had quite significant transparency issues, we did a report making certain recommendations. When they didn't respond to that, we brought the report to Parliament. Parliament supported the work that we did. Now, it didn't mean that overnight the Council was going to accept what we did, but what it did was to feed in to a larger argument, a larger debate taking place in civil society and Member State Parliaments uh, and elsewhere with the aim of influencing that cultural change within the council to enable it to become more transparent. And in fact, it's it's the Dutch government that has actually led the charge um, in, in relation to that. Um, at the moment as well, we're also doing an investigation into how the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control operated when COVID came to Europe. Uh, was it capable of dealing with what happened to all of us and, and, and to, to the EU, what has it done since? So in relation to that, what we're looking at is the interaction between the ECDC and the member states. You know, were the member states giving sufficient information to enable the ECDC to do its work? 
Um, so we're also looking at, uh, we got a complaint in relation to the treatment of asylum seekers and migrants on the Croatian border, which some of you may have been reading about. Now, we're not looking at what Croatia does in relation to that, but we're looking at the way in which funding that the Commission gave to the Croatian authorities for border management and human rights protection and all of that, we're looking at the way in which that money is being used. So it's not Croatia we're looking at, we're looking at the institution, but it obviously has an impact. It, it, it can influence the situation there. So that's just a flavour of, of what we do. On any given week, we don't know what sort of complaints we're going to get. We don't know what sort of investigations we're going to open. It could be anything. Um, and that's why I think uh, that's what makes the office very interesting. Um, we also do what I call own initiative investigations, which I have the power under the statute to open an investigation into an issue, even if I haven't got a complaint about it, but if I think it is of sufficient public interest to do so. So, for example, when the US um, EU trade negotiations were going on a few years ago, we opened an investigation into the transparency of that so that everybody could see what was going on between the two, between the EU and the US, so they could seek to influence that if they were a bit concerned about it. Uh, and we've opened the, um, the the council initiative was also um, uh, was also uh, an investigation on our on our own initiative. Uh, so we can be very flexible in, in the way that we work. Um, now, in relation to just briefly, yes, we, we take interns every year. And in fact, we recently had an intern who went uh, to your college. And I understand that he has now moved on and he's working in the European Investment Bank. So yes. experience in our office is very good. Yes, you're aware of this uh, because we have fingers in so many pies, to use that English expression, you know, where we're dealing with the Commission, with the Parliament, with the EIB, with the European Court of Auditors, with all of those agencies, so that if you do get an internship with us, um, you are exposed uh, to, to a lot. And just, just briefly, you mentioned a network. Network is critical. You may all be geniuses, you may all get first class honours in your degrees, but how you are as individuals, what your attitude is, and your communication and other skills in building up a network is vital. Because if you talk to young people your own age or maybe a bit older in Brussels and you ask them, how did, how did you get the job? It wasn't always standard going through the EPSO route, um, which, which deals with civil service competition. So, well, I knew somebody or I got a job with an MEP or this happened or that happened and then I went here, there and everywhere. I mean, one colleague of mine, uh, started as a, an assistant to an MEP, then came to work for me, and then went to work for Google when they promptly sent him to Oxford University to do a master's. So who knows where even the smallest uh, a step can bring you. So as I said, it's not always your academic qualifications which are important. Everybody who seeks a job in a European institution tends to be quite clever. So we're always looking out for that extra special piece. And be pushy, you know, be pushy. <laughs> Especially the women, <laughs> you know, yeah. don't be afraid to, uh, to, as they say, to, to, to show off, you know, you've, you've done so well in getting to where you're doing. The mere fact that you're sitting here listening to the European Ombudsman on a lovely afternoon means that you are engaged uh, with, with your careers and, and you are interested in this. And let me tell you, that is a huge part of it. So thank you. And I welcome any questions you may have. Okay. Just very briefly, because I would like to give the floor for, to students, it's their event. Uh, I would like to just kick off this um, interview by a very general question on the future of uh, ADR in EU institutions. So um, I mentioned at the beginning that we studied uh, ADR uh, and its role in increasing transparency and legitimacy of different regulatory actors. So, uh, so far, I think in Europe, we have heard about uh, ADR in a negative sense. This also concerns uh, TTIP negotiations uh, in which your office uh, also took part or investigation uh, consultations in this regard. So um, my question is, um, that your own office shows that European institutions can also very much benefit from ADR to increase the transparency of their work. And uh, the question here is whether, in your opinion, uh, we should have more ADR schemes to be applied to EU institutions to further democratize their work. 
Um, thank you for that question, and it's an excellent question. Um, I I think that um, the EU institutions, in comparison to some of the member states, they're they are quite transparent, and 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 their integrity levels are quite high. But I always say that they should be because of the huge role that they play and the increasingly huge role that they play. I mean, we've seen as well now uh, after the pandemic how the EU is trying to gain um, greater powers in relation to um, public health protection, for example, you know. Um, so my my view would be that um, what is important is, is to use the mechanisms that are that are already there. Um, and I've certainly, in relation to my office, which is a, 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 a sort of alternative dispute uh, resolution mechanism, I've been, I've been trying to to maximise uh, that work as much as I can. But very often, it's 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 the follow through to the work um, that we do. I mean, one of the one of the big issues, uh, as you know, especially nowadays when when there are rule of law issues with with some of the member states is the legitimacy of the EU. And this was a huge part of the whole Brexit conversation where they pointed to faceless, unaccountable bureaucrats um, uh, and all of that. So when I make a recommendation in relation to transparency or in relation to ethics or in relation to integrity generally, I always invoke, I use that concept of legitimacy. And democracy as we know is fragile. And I suppose none of us five years ago could have anticipated the events in the UK, in the US, elsewhere in the EU. And I think this has taught us all a very sharp lesson about democracy. So I think the value of, 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 the, of the ADR and those sort of uh, mechanisms for, as you say, uh, supporting democracy through increasing transparency uh, and all of that is that it increases the legitimacy of the institutions. So if I make a recommendation or if a scandal emerges in, in the EU, the result of it is much greater than the actual event itself because of the propaganda value that can, that can, that can be exploited by not people who are just you're a skeptic, but people who are absolutely hostile to the EU. So when people talk about it, uh, transparency, integrity, ethics, they're not you know, abstract concepts to be studied by your students or, you know, to be talked about by civil society, they actually have real vital meaning in the world. And that's what I am, my office and my colleagues try to do to make those links between the EU being afraid that its legitimacy is weakening to the everyday things it does in relation to those issues. Thank you. And now a question from a student, Ms. Tarnowski. Um, hello, Ms. O'Reilly. I am Mihaela Tarnowski and I'm a student uh, that is also involved in the electorate multilevel regulation. Uh, I joined because I am interested in good governance and also in any alternative means of dispute resolution. And uh, also I wanted to really interview you because um, I, it's really good to see female leaders in good govern in governance. And so I would like to ask you, what exactly propelled you to pursue a career as an ombudsman, uh, first as an Irish ombudsman and then the European Union ombudsman, um, because um, before that you were a successful journalist and author. What exactly attracted you to this field? Well, when I became, as you say, I, I, I was a journalist and an author for, for many years, but 20 years, um, in fact. I started when I was very young, I should I should point out, um, and I greatly enjoyed journalism. I mean, from the time I was a small child, I was taking an interest in, in the world around me, in politics, current affairs, and so on. I mean, I can remember the American elections in the 1960s, uh, so that, that's quite a long time ago. And I was always engaged in the world, and when the opportunity came to become an ombudsman in Ireland, I was also going to become information commissioner, which uh, was a separate role um, uh, dealing with transparency or freedom of information requests. And I was also on the sort of the ethics body, um, the, the national ethics body in relation to, uh, um, you know, uh, public officials and so on. So it incorporated a lot. I was also commissioner for environmental information as well. So all of those issues I was hugely interested in. 
And even though uh, I was not going to be perhaps as free uh, to be as opinionated as I might have been as a journalist uh, in, in, in discussing them, it was, it was the same. It was the same area, as, as I said at the beginning. I mean, it was, you know, when I'm, I'm doing, I did investigations when I was a journalist. I'm doing investigations now. You know, I'm, 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 I'm trying always to uh, explore uh, and make better that relationship between between the citizen and um, and, uh, and and the administration. Certainly, in the early years, people would ask me if if I if I missed journalism, uh, and and certainly when there were very exciting political events um, going on. Yes, of course, you know, you'd like to be in the thick of it and writing about it or or talking about it and so on. But in fact, I think what gives us all satisfaction in our careers is, is that um, we see ourselves making a difference. I know that seems like a bit of a cliche. I mean, I hope and I think that when I was a journalist, I made a difference. And I hope that as ombudsman, both at national level and, and European level, that I make a difference. But every day I'm still listening, watching the media, um, you know, still engaged in everything that I was engaged in before. It's it's a, it's a different it's a different format. It's a different way of working, but it's the same to use the word sensibility that I bring to both jobs. Thank you. Now, uh, Ms. Farwati has a question about your career as European Ombudsman as well. Uh, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. I can. Yes. Okay. Uh, my name is Nadia Parawati, and I am a fourth year student at The Hague University. Uh, and I am uh, responsible for the social media accounts and also researching for ADR cases. And uh, now we are also working on a newspaper related with uh, ADR topics. And uh, I am very curious to know on uh, what is the achievement you are most proud of during your career and what is the main difficulty you have encountered throughout your seven-year career as the European Ombudsman? Um, thank you for that question. Um, I, I, think, I, I think what I'm proudest of in relation to my job as European Ombudsman is that you know when I came into the office um, I, I, I call it a, a small office with a, with a big mandate. Um, I explained the mandate uh, to you at the beginning, watchdog over the entire EU administration. And I was determined to make the office more visible, more relevant and more impactful. Um, and I did that by setting out a very clear strategic plan in relation to, you know, the core of it was um, focusing more than the office had previously done on own initiative investigations, finding those investigations that were of significant public interest um, that we could do in, in the hope and expectation of a good uh, resolution. So that served a very important purpose because it brought our work to the attention of, of more people and particularly people involved in civil society organizations and so on. And what that led to was a, a greater number of, of complaints coming to us uh, that, that were of public interest. Um, and then, um, so over, over the last few years, there has been a significant increase in the number of uh, uh, cases that we're dealing with, and I think we're getting into more and more important cases in terms of the public. I mean, for example, at the moment, we're looking into the, the, the Mercosur agreement between the EU and some of the South American uh, um, countries in, in, in relation to environmental impacts and, and, and so on. We're also looking at a case involving um, a contract that was awarded by the Commission to the BlackRock Investment Company, which is a multi-trillion uh, dollar investment company based in the US, which you, you may be aware of. We're looking at the Croatian issue. Uh, we're looking at issues around Frontex and, and all of that. Um, so I believe, I, I think that my what I'm proudest of on behalf of myself in, in my colleagues is that we have inserted ourselves um, into uh, that EU space where I believe we absolutely should be. And, and one of the things, just to make a point about, about ADR, is, is one of the great things about it is its flexibility. 
and it's it's relative informality, you know, compared to a uh, to the courts and going through that 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 judicial system, because anybody can come to me. It's a free service. Um, yes, people don't have to. The institutions don't have to accept my recommendations, but in general, they do, or they accept some of them. And all the time, you're influencing change. And very often, you, you're 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 not talking precise points of law, but you're talking about wider principles around an issue. I mean, just just briefly, it was a case I meant to mention. A few years ago, an Austrian, uh, a young Austrian woman who had been an intern with the WAS, that's the um, European External Action Service, like the, the foreign service of the EU, came to us with a complaint that interns in the WAS were not paid. They were paid in other parts of the, uh, of the EU, in the Commission, for example, but not there. And she thought this wasn't fair. And we also thought it wasn't fair. It wasn't against the law as such. There was no regulation against it. But think about it. Let's say one of you guys got a job as an intern in WES and you were going to have to live in somewhere in Southeast Asia for six months. I mean, fantastic opportunity, but you would have to pay for your own travel. You'd have to pay for your own accommodation. You'd have to pay to eat and drink and survive and all of that. If you have parents or your own or, you know, guardians or your own resources, then you could afford to do it. But some of you who might be brilliant, but do not have the resources, couldn't do it. So the argument that we used in relation to that was the anti-discrimination on grounds of social origin clause in the, in, in, in the treaty. It's one of the high values of, of the treaty. So it wasn't, you know, so, so, that, so we had a conversation really with the council uh, in, in relation to that, not on strict points of law, which might have been the case had you gone to court, but, but you know, much, much bigger plane, a much bigger picture. And the result was that the council, with the support of Parliament, agreed to pay the interns, and now and now that is done. I'm not saying that that means that every person with with few resources can afford to take them up, but more can. And again, it 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 set it set that standard. So um, just to go back to, to 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 your question, yes, I think you know my my plan from day one to make the office more effective, have more of an impact, and and I think um, in in general we we have achieved that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, Ms. Tarnowski actually has uh, actually uh, a question, uh, actually uh, having a, a goal in life, an aim in life uh, from uh, Ms. Farwati. Hello again. Uh, in 2004, in an interview, you have said that the worst thing in life is to have no aim. What has your aim been in life? <laughs> yeah, it's such a good question. Um, um, it's something that I, I, I preach to my to my own adult children about. Um, you actually have to sit there and listen to me. Um, they don't. <laughs> but um, but what, I, what I want for all of them uh, is I'm sure what, what, what your parents, your guardians, the people who love you want for you uh, is that you have an aim in life, you have an ambition. You know, it doesn't have to be to become the next president of the commission or, you know, whatever, to become a billionaire or, you know, invent the next fabulous piece of software. It can be anything. But what, what energizes all of us and what makes us really fully human, uh, I think, is to be able to make an impact on the world that speaks to us uh, as human beings, um, but also speaks to the world in some way. Um, I mean, a, a friend of mine always says you should imagine being at your own funeral and what you want people to say about you. you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a good way of looking at your career, folks. Um, you know that uh, that that you know obviously that you were loved by your family, hopefully, but that that you know that that you were good to your friends, to the wider community, uh, but also that you exerted yourself on on the public stage. And I think particularly for women, because you know women of to a degree my own generation but certainly my mother's generation never had the opportunity to have a public voice to impact on the public sphere now we have and as i tell my own children i think we don't just have the capacity to do it i think we have a duty to do it and i know that not everybody has you know a, a defined aim or a dream at, at a certain point um, but I think we, we, you know, as I say to my own kids, it's a big world out there. You're privileged. You can make a difference, big or small, but find out where it is you're going to make 
that difference. Um, and uh, yeah, and I think, I guess, young or old during COVID, we've all had an opportunity for greater introspection. You know, I think we've all been able to maybe step back from our daily lives and think about, well, what am I, what am I here for? Or what am I going to do? And, and also sensing how precious and how short uh, that that life is. So let's make the most of it personally, professionally, and just, you know, in relation to whatever we can do to, to, to I know this is a terrible cliche, but really to make it a better place. Um, and, and I think that's why, that's what I mean when I say, it's great. I love when I hear people saying, this is my aim, uh, because once you are directed in a certain way, your own interest and passion will, will drive you on and will be a big part of driving you on. Thank you. Uh, now, Miss Dervish has a question about managing time. Uh, hello, I'm Suela Dervish. I am a fourth year international and European law student and specializing in commercial law. Uh, I am the coordinator of multi level regulation student projects and I joined because I wanted to expand my knowledge while at the same time I wanted to figure out what I really wanted to do in life. Um, so thank you very much for your inspirational words and um, those were really, really motivational. Earlier in the interview you did mention that you wanted to make a difference in the world and you reaffirmed just now that uh, having an aim in life is, is really important. Um, and those words really uh, stuck in my mind because I think as, as a student we are all having difficulties or we're all in a phase that we really do not know what to do in life. But we do want to make a difference. And I do believe that making a difference in the world requires too much time and also strong motivation. And sometimes this duty as being an EU ombudsman can clash with your personal time. Uh, how have you managed finding a balance between uh, your professional life, wanting to make a difference in the world, uh, with your personal life? Thank you. Um, I, I suppose, in, in a way, it, it would, well, Again, I mean, I, I referred earlier to, to one's attitude. Um, I, I think if, if you have the attitude that things are going to be difficult, then they will be difficult. If you have an attitude, though, no, I'll manage somehow, not see the barriers, then I'm not saying the barriers won't be there, but I think it'll be easier for you to overcome them. Um, I suppose when I was, uh, you know, now this is really the first time that you know, I, I don't have children, but one left in college, but, but that is, so I don't have that whole family thing going on. But certainly throughout the, the, the 90s, I had a very busy career in journalism. And then later as, as ombudsman, when the children were still very young, um, I had five under the age of nine at one point. So that was that was tricky. I have a wonderful partner. Uh, so there's never been a question of not sharing all, all of that. Uh, and, and that's and, and that is one thing. But I think also, you know, to be, to be absolutely honest about it, one of the things that helped me particularly in my mothering role was the flexibility of the work that I did. I mean, when I was a journalist, my editors didn't care whether I was writing at midnight with a baby attached to me or, you know, writing at four o'clock in the afternoon as long as I as I produced. I was never in a confined nine to five uh, thing. And, and I think for, I know the women in, in, in my office, parents in my office, the big thing is flexibility you know that, that they can have that that, that 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 time to manage their their lives and that is a huge 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 part of it and then when i became ombudsman and european ombudsman well i was the boss so that helps as well um i i can be flexible there but throughout my career i've always been flexible i don't care what time i work at when i work whether it's weekends or that's not that i kill myself but but you know being able to manage your work around the other parts of your life i mean I suppose one part of it that does sort of go maybe hobbies and you know those extracurricular stuff it, it's if you can manage you know work and small children but work small children and something else can can be difficult but it's all a balance and um yeah but I, again i go back to what i said at the beginning if you think it's going to be impossible then it will be you know if you think no i can manage it then you will and I see I'm down to 1% in my computer, so I'm going to go offline very quickly. So um, I can rush to get a plug if you like, or, or if somebody else has any more questions, I'd be happy to answer them. So very last question from Dr. Vavas. 
Very quickly then, thank you very much for all these uh, inspirational thoughts and you already gave quite a few tips for students on how to um, uh, try to build up their career path towards European institutions. And my question is on that. You mentioned network building. Could you uh, give us maybe uh, one practical tip how you think our students should navigate uh, around uh, contemporary opportunities and uh, uh, what is the most effective way for them to build networks to be able to achieve uh, um, to end up in one of the European institutions. Thank you. Okay, okay. just in case I disappear, I'll say this quickly. Um, um, first of all, older people in general like giving younger people advice. So don't be afraid to ask them for that advice. Um, because in a way they're flattered, oh, somebody wants to know what I think or somebody thinks I can do help them and that's great. And also because a lot of older people have their own children and they also would want people to, to help them. Try and get over a natural shyness to contact people and so on, and that's important. But I'll give you one tip. The Irish European movement brings out a book every year called the Green Book, okay? write it down, the Green Book, European Movement Ireland. And in that is a list of everybody in Brussels and every organization, public sector, private sector, all of that. And every time a young person or the parent of a young person asks me about that, um, I, I mention the Green Book. And then just start ringing, start writing. You just don't know, you might at the right moment just hit, God, somebody was looking for an intern. And I know some of, some of, some of my colleagues Megan here, who has just joined the office um, uh, as my colleague. I mean, she heard that we had a vacancy through somebody else. And then she, you know, like everybody has that. You just need the first little foot on the ladder and everything can flow from that. So don't be afraid. When there's a European Parliament election, you know, who are your MEPs? They'd be looking for people. Um, you know, look, look at the NGOs, look at the lobbying firms. I mean, it's all it's all legitimate. Just ask, be pushy, be pushy, be pushy. Uh, do your homework, be polite, be respectful. And no matter what they say to you, get back to them, thank them. People like being thanked, people like politeness. The people that I really admire in my office are those who are proactive, um, who have um, really good manners. Yes, I, I think we lost uh, Miss Ray. Um, so uh, I would like to enjoy uh, to, to uh, thank uh, Miss O'Reilly and as well uh, Miss Kilian and Miss Bartolucci as well uh, uh, for this interview. Uh, of course, uh, we'll send of course uh, this uh, video to as well uh, you to your office. But uh, just I want to thank uh, of course your office, the office on the European Union for your time obviously, as well uh, to say that uh, many students, not only students from the university, will be watching uh, this interview uh, on the day of our event. So many thanks again, Miss Kilian because you are here online. So thank you uh, for, for your office, obviously. And as well to your colleague, thank Ms. Bartolucci. Thank you very much. And Emily just got back. Finally, our students got the opportunity to discuss democracy and demography on this year of migration crisis and controversial elections with the Vice President of the European Commission and her Head of Cabinet. Dear professors, dear students and public and private organizations joining us from around the world, thank you for this opportunity to speak to you. I hope you are all healthy and enjoying your learning experience across the rich program of international and European Union law at Hague University. Speaking to you takes me back to my time lecturing at university before my political life began. As we venture out in the world, our paths can go in many different directions. Whatever you decide to do, hold on strongly to your courage and self-belief. Keep an open mind, be curious and embrace change when it comes. See opportunities in crisis. If you match this advice with the skills and knowledge you are gaining at university, you will be limited only by your ambition. Learning is a lifelong process. 
As a vice president in the European Commission, I'm learning about the unforeseen circumstances of COVID-19 and the effect it's having on our citizens' lives and on our democracy. I'm learning about building the future of European Union. Young people must also shape our future. Your voice must be heard, and I hope you will join us in the Conference on the Future of Europe. I will say more about this in a few moments. The future is not just about young people, it is about all generations. This leads me to learning about demography. To prepare for the future, we must address the demographic transition taking place across our aging European Union. This new Commission portfolio on democracy and demography often raises questions. Not everyone understands that democracy and demography are cross-cutting and complementary. Not everyone sees how they, are, they, they fit together. Our European Union and the world are changing. Climate change and digitalization are key drivers, but so is demographic change. It may be slow and silent, but it affects us all and will gain a prominence as Europe's aging population steadily increases. Consequently, my task is to strengthen the links between people and the democratic institutions that serve them. Knowing the trends and the impacts of demographic change contributes to this, at all levels, local, regional, national and European. When we discuss demography, essentially we talk about people's lives. COVID-19 has exposed unprecedented challenges for our health, our economy and our social well-being and demonstrates the importance of addressing demographic challenges. First, the virus has not hit every member state in the same way. Secondly, it has not hit men and women in the same way. Thirdly, it has not hit the young and the elderly in the same way. The COVID-19 outbreak exposed the vulnerability of older people to pandemics and their diseases, notably because they are more likely to have underlying health conditions. The elderly and others have also endured profound social, social isolation and loneliness. Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear students, dear professors and employers, let us continue together on our journey of learning. I hope that you will raise awareness on how people can contribute to the Green Paper on Aging, the long-term vision in rural areas and the child's rights strategy. You can do the same for the Conference on the Future of Europe and organize events under the umbrella of the conference. I look forward to building on these initiatives with you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, thank you for the floor. Um, according to the speech of Vice President Dupravka Shrisa, following the launch of the European Commission's report, the EU is witnessing a demographic change in the context of an aging population, low birth rates, and deteriorating working age conditions. So how does such demographic shift actually affect the labor market? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I hope you can hear me well. Yes. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much for this opportunity to have this this uh, exchange of views with you, and uh, especially since I myself have a legal background as well as my, my colleague Iris who is joining us. So, so I feel very much at, at home in this uh, in this environment with uh, with, with colleagues. Um, to to address the the, the question, um, the. This is the first time that there is a, uh, a member of the College of Commissioners who is responsible specifically for demography and more, perhaps I think it would be more accurate to say, for um, approaching the challenge of demographic change. Um, because, in fact, this is something that has a very broad implication, I think, on all aspects of, uh, of, of, of policy making. And, uh, and, in fact, our aspiration is to try to uh, find ways to make our policies more effective by taking into account the fact that there is demographic change um, going on and that, um, that populations are shifting, that people are living longer, that uh, families are having less children, um, that households are increasingly uh, smaller. Um, all of these have implications. And um, one of them so is, um, is how, for instance, the working age population um, 
is becoming relatively smaller, especially when compared to the number of people who are living longer. So you have more people who are of a pensionable age, but less people, relatively, who are working to sustain those people who are of pensionable age. Um, now, of course, the fact that people are living longer is a great thing, and it's a great achievement, perhaps one of the greatest achievements that, uh, that uh, uh, we have in, in modern times. It's a bit strange to say this at a time of a pandemic when uh, things are, are, are the way we all know they are, but the reality is that, broadly speaking, we still are living longer lives, we are living healthier lives as well. Um, so, um, so people are, even when they reach the age of retirement, they tend to have a pretty long period of, of healthy, active life before they become, full, they become more dependent on, on others. Um, so, um, for instance, at the moment, we're working on a, uh, a green paper on aging. And many people, when you mention a green paper on aging, imagine that what we're talking about is a green paper on old people or what we can do for old people. But that's not the case at all, because aging is something that starts the minute you're born. And uh, the fact that uh, yourselves, for example, people like yourselves who are um, about to get into the, into the work market, uh, you have the prospect of a much longer life than your grandparents did. So that will have an impact on how you plan your education, how you plan your work. Um, and, uh, and this is something that we need to, to take into account. We can no longer um, come up with um, employment policies, uh, uh, economic policies, social policies, which are uh, modeled on a different demographic reality. Um, and, um, and so what we are trying to do is to take all of these factors into account. Um, this means that, so the reality is that the working age uh, population is going to be relatively small. So one thing we can do is to make it larger. And that is, for instance, to, uh, and I think it's particularly uh, interesting in this setting, we need to have more women coming into the uh, into the labor market because women are still less um, active in the labor market in Europe, around 11% um, less than men present in the uh, in the work market. We need to look at how um, migration, managed migration, can help to boost the, um, uh, the the labor market. We have to look at how costs can be brought down, and costs not, are not only wages. There are other types of costs. Which are um, uh, which are linked to the creation of jobs, and very often these have to do with uh, with bureaucracy, with red tape. If we reduce red tape, then that means that um, uh, people are going to be able to be more productive, and those costs or that that uh, money can be allocated somewhere else. Um, we need to adapt the labor market. I mentioned before the fact that uh, um, people who are entering the job market have a longer prospect ahead of them. People are generally expecting to work around 20% more than their parents and grandparents did, simply because their lives are longer and because retirement ages might become, um, might be later. Um, and, uh, and that means that we need to have a more flexible uh, job market. It's less likely, I, I, I imagine if, if you were to sort of share your aspirations, I think that you approach work in a very different way to the way I did when I was your age. Um, for me, it was still very much the fact that you have you get into the job market and you have a career for your life. That's not the case uh, today anymore. People are far more open to the idea of having multiple careers, uh, some of them su sometimes successive, sometimes even in parallel. So the job market needs to be able to be flexible enough to cater for for those uh, for for those uh, wishes, I mentioned retirement age, and uh, that that's uh, in fact one of the important aspects. Obviously, this isn't something that the European Commission can determine. This is something member states have to determine. Um, but increasingly, we're going to see that not only people, will people need to work longer to to uh, support the older population, but people are going to want to work for longer because. Uh, at the moment, retirement ages are somewhere between, in general, uh, between 60 and 65. But most people who are age 60 to 65 today um, are very healthy, are very um, driven. They want to work for longer. Uh, they might decide to, uh, to retire, but then to embark on a new career, whether that is to uh, using their skills, whether it's to, to 
be entrepreneurs, um, whether it's to volunteer. Uh, volunteering is something, for example, that we, we don't give enough attention to. Mm. But a lot of people, especially people who are retired and who are still active, um, are, are contributing in a, quite a direct way to the economy because they are engaged in volunteer work, whether that's care, whether that's to run social centers or sports centers, for example, as well sometimes. But, but that is also a contribution that supplements the economic activity. So, um, so these, are, these are all factors that we are trying to take into account. It's, it's all very new because, uh, because this is something that, uh, while the issues themselves that I have mentioned are not new, but approaching them in this way is something very new. And mainstreaming them across policymaking is, is, is still an open. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now there is a question as well uh, from uh, Ms. Tarnowski concerning uh, uh, the aspect of a uh, social policy, because we always have uh, citizens who ask to have more uh, social, uh, I would say, more social services in the European Union. Yes, uh, indeed, Mr. Chaluna, I was wondering, um, because the refugee crisis prompted this demographic change and more citizens needed access to social services, um, what project exactly has the European Commission focused on in order to address this problem? Um, first of all, I, I should say that, that the um, social services, more specifically, is not something that is our direct responsibility. We coordinate this area broadly, um, but there is a commissioner, uh, Commissioner Schmidt, uh, who is the one who is responsible for um, for this uh, this area. So I wouldn't want to to go too much in depth on a, on an area which is not our direct competence. But I, I can I can react to some extent at least on um, uh, on, 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 on your question. First of all, a lot of what you are referring to, well, social services broadly speaking, um, is something which is the competence of member states. So the European Union does not have specific responsibility to be able to legislate in a way that is enforceable. Um, however, uh, and this is something that we're seeing very much, especially in the context of COVID-19, there is a, a great desire among member states to coordinate. And what we try to do is is two things really. One is to gather best practices so that one member state can look quite easily at what somebody else is doing, because ultimately many of the challenges, many of the issues are the same wherever you wherever you are. Secondly, we try to establish standards and we, um, we, we give guidelines. You might have noticed, for example, that especially in the early days of, of the COVID-19 crisis, there were many, many guidelines coming out of the European Commission. And when you see the word guideline, that means that we cannot legislate, but we are suggesting, we are proposing to member states what they should do. And in most cases, they actually take this on board because, uh, because you know, what we're trying to do is not uh, impose a burden. If anything, it is to try to, uh, to, to, to support, to, to, to help effectively, to deal with, uh, with, uh, with these specific issues. Um, now, uh, you, you made the, uh, the connection in the, um, to, to also to migration. Um, and, um, and of course, here we have to make a distinction between, uh, between legal migration, uh, managed migration, and, uh, and regular migration. Um, and, uh, and in fact, this is a topic, and I believe that there will be more questions about this coming up, so perhaps I won't go into too much detail but, uh, at this stage. But, uh, but it's very important that we, we know what kind of movement of people we are talking about. Um, and because because there are different legal regimes that apply depending on how people are, are categorized. But I'll leave it at that for now, and, and I'm sure that there will be an opportunity to go into some more detail on these aspects with some of the other I'll, uh, I'll stop. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, very good as well because of this topic, uh, we one of our students, uh, Miss Tarnowski, was in a meeting as well uh, in March with Commissioner Reinders, and we uh, as well spoke about uh, this uh, protection of uh, child, and as well with the President of Europol uh, some some weeks ago. Um, now there is a question more on the elections because it is of course uh, a year with a lot of elections and a very long one in the United States lately, but before as well in Belarus and in Europe in general. Uh, Ms. Plasoro, could you talk about more the mandatory aspect of the elections? Yes, of course. So, uh, I, indeed, I would like to follow up on, uh, on an issue that concerns us uh, all as, uh, as EU citizens, which is uh, voting. 
Um, and we know that voting in European election is not compulsory, uh, except in five member states, actually, uh, Belgium, Bulgaria, Greece and Luxembourg, where voting is compulsory. But on this point, um, given that the official and final turnout in the 2019 uh, European election was uh, just over 50 percent, um, although it had increased since the 2014 uh, election, we could perhaps hope for uh, better participation. So in this sense, would uh, compulsory voting, mandatory voting be uh, preferable, advisable at EU level? Um, first of all, I mean, we, we've, we've all been following the, the elections in the United States and we've all been hearing about how there isn't one voting system across, or especially certainly not one counting system across the um, whole, all of the 50 states. And, and to some extent, we have the same situation in Europe when it comes to the European Parliament elections, because each member state adopts its own voting system. In most cases, it's the same system they use for their national elections. Not in all, because there are some where there are where there are slight uh, slight changes, but uh, but effectively the uh, the competence for deciding how voting should be conducted depends on each individual member state. So, for example, you mentioned Belgium, um, which has compulsory voting for national elections and also for the European elections, um, and and there are a few others. Now, very, so, so the Commission doesn't have a position on this. This is up to up to each in the individual member state to decide. My personal opinion is that I'm, I'm not a fan of compulsory voting. I have to say, because I think that people should be encouraged to, uh, to vote for other reasons than the fact that if they don't, they will be fined. Um, and uh, and they you know they they need to be engaged. No, but at the same time. You're right that we need to find ways to engage people more. And very often um, we see that the European Parliament elections, the level of, uh, of, 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 of voting is, is even lower than that at, uh, at the national election. Um, it's quite interesting to see that in a number of member states, in fact, um, the trend is that um, voting in local elections is actually higher than it is in, uh, in national or in European elections, which suggests that the, the closer people feel to the level of government or to their representatives, then the more they're likely to, um, uh, to go to vote. Um, that's not necessarily a scientific uh, conclusion, but, but it, it would suggest that this is the case. Um, I happen to come from a country which is a very small country, but where when we have uh, recently we had an election where the turnout was 88% and everyone was shocked how low it was. Because regularly our, we have 93, 94, 95% of turnout. And that's primarily because the, the political parties mobilize people. And, uh, and uh, uh, it, it's true, it's also because it is a small, close to knit community. So, so it, it's more contagious in a way. The, 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 uh, sort of the political fever is is more contagious uh, at, at at that uh, at that level, but it's also because people do feel that their vote counts and it will make a difference. I think that in in larger contexts they might feel that that uh, that's less less the case. Perhaps that's also another lesson to be drawn from the U.S. elections, where we've seen that in some states the margins were extremely uh, extremely small. So uh, so that does show that in reality, even in in such a large country. Every vote can actually count. Um, now, how do we encourage people to vote? I think it's in everyone's interest that we encourage people to vote at all levels uh, of decision making, but more specifically for for European Parliament elections. And I think one of them is, um, as I said, to make people feel closer to the work of the European Parliament, more familiar to the work of the European Parliament. Um, in fact, I think one of the stories we need to tell a bit more is how the the role of the European Parliament has evolved over time. Um, the, the, the first direct elections were in 1979. Before that, national parliaments would nominate some members to sit in the European Parliament in the way that we still have that kind of system in the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. Um, but in 1979, a decision was taken to, um, to vote to elect uh, members of the European Parliament directly. At that point, and for a number of years, it was possible for deputies to be both national parliamentarians and European parliamentarians. 
And that was the case until about 10 years ago, I think. And about 10 years ago, it was decided, no, if you're going to be a European parliamentarian, you should only be a part of European parliamentarian. So this has shown the, the greater focus on European issues. Um, but uh, b besides that, perhaps even more importantly, is the way that the European Parliament is more and more involved in the decision making and is a, is a crucial actor in, uh, in, in all the decisions that are taken at the European level and which have an impact on, on people's lives. Uh, yesterday we heard, for example, that uh, a decision was reached on the, uh, on the latest EU budget. Um, and this is something that is negotiated by the Commission, the Parliament and the Council, the Member States, as equal partners. So the European Parliament has as important a role there as, uh, as, as the other institutions. Um, so, so I think that, that very often it, it depends on, 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 on issues and on um, promoting the impact of one's vote. Um, I think one of the, the um, elements that helped to raise the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the number of, uh, of the, the level of participation in the last European elections um, was in fact the, the rise of populism, or rather a backlash to the rise of populism in the, in, in the last few years, um, where a number of the, of the mainstream parties and some new mainstream parties um, deliberately stood on a platform of countering this, this populism. Um, and while the populists did very well, they still did very well, because if you look at the, uh, um, both the, uh, the far right and the far left, the populists of, of both, both extremes on the, on the, uh, on the, on the spectrum, um, they, they did extremely well. Um, and, and if you add them up together, you would come to something over 20% of the seats in the, in the European Parliament, uh, which, which is not insignificant. But the, um, the anti-populist um, vote um, not only was even stronger, but very interestingly, it created a, a new coalition. So while for a long time you had um, the Christian Democrats and the Social Democrats who together monopolized European politics, um, now you have a new uh, coalition which has developed, which includes the, uh, the, the liberals and other centrists, as well as the Greens and other sort of moderates on, on both sides of the, uh, of the political spectrum. Um, and, and this is, at first, everybody thought that this was going to be a very difficult coalition because it had so many components. But in fact, um, while there are complications, of course, but in fact, it is, I think, proving to be more smooth because there is a, um, a unity of objective. That is being um, pro-European, being uh, anti-populist anti and, and, and trying to, uh, to take, take things forward in a, in a more constructive manner. Um, and I and I would hope that if this is if this reaches the population, that this can be a more effective way of getting them to be interested in voting, than if you make it uh, an obligation to vote. Uh, I mean, it is an obligation in a in an ethical sense because as a citizen, we are always taught that it is your duty to go to vote. Um, but and and that's why also, as I said at the beginning, I'm not a fan of of forcing people to vote because people should do it because they really want to. But that's very much my view and is not a view of, of, the, of the institution that I work with. Yeah, I'll, I'll ask my question. Uh, what will the EU Commission do to ensure that the EU prevents future refugee crises on its territory, like the recent one in Moria? Good luck with, with all Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Abraham as well. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. What we showed you today are just edited parts of the interviews. The long versions of these interviews, as well as the interviews conducted by the students with the EU Commissioner for Justice Reinders and the Vice President Skenas, will also be available on YouTube very shortly after this ceremony. Now comes the final part of the ceremony, our speakers of our two alumni. The support shown by our community of 850 alumni around the world was crucial this year. Before giving the floor to the two alumni, Maximilian Garay and Camila Sakalovskaite, sharing their experience and their career, 
Here is a short video of what my fellow 120 alumni did with my colleague, Mr. LaRange, in spring to encourage our students. Thank you, Ms. Montero, and also many thanks to Mr. Lorange to speak here today at DNA 2020 as an alumni of the program. As already mentioned, I'm a former student of this program, graduated in 2012, and today I work for the European Space Agency as a contracts officer. Now, this is of course not an instant occurrence, but instead, just like you, I started in the first year, in my case in 2008, and went through the four years of the program, enjoyed its many obstacles and came out with what I would consider a very good and solid foundation in terms of knowledge of the law itself, but also, and maybe more importantly, a good set of soft skills, such as, for instance, communications, presentation skills and basic interaction skills, for instance, with your fellow students, but also with teachers. So. In my view, the program prepares you very well for your future steps, whatever they may be. If I could give you an advice for while you're following the program, that would be to take advantage of, for instance, the projects such as due diligence project, but also the moot court activities. In my view, those projects and activities provide you with a very good idea and sometimes first-hand knowledge of what real-life interactions may actually be like. They will also prepare you to work well with others, which is fundamental for any future employment, that you can work well in a team, even so if you have, or especially so, if you have different set of capabilities, cultural background and so forth. Thus, take full advantage of those activities. Then, Overall, the program prepares you extremely well to, for instance, follow on a future uh, academic studies such as master degrees, which in my case, I continued my master degree 
at the Maastricht University. First, I took a master in European Union law and then one in globalization and international law. The difference between those masters is that for me, the master uh, level was really focused on autonomous learning and not so much on group activities. In that sense, this year will certainly challenge you as opposed to the uh, program you're completing here to work on yourself more and uh, produce these uh, results within just one year and not give you chance to develop over four years. But a master degree will then really allow you to also, let's say, specialize on certain fields, but sometimes also give an opportunity to know what you may not like so much and make a transition to a different master course instead. Shortly after the master, uh, you will probably face the same obstacles as I will, and that is the job applications. Now, I don't think there's a golden rule to follow in terms of job applications, but certainly one experience I would like to share with you is the job applications will probably not lead immediately to a job interview and even less so immediately to a job offer in the first occasion. Instead, realize what it is. It is a competition with other applicants and you may go through various applications and regret letters and a number of interviews and sometimes their feedback on how to improve until one day and I'm sure you will receive that is that uh, you have a job offer then. In my case that was for instance I think between eight or nine months of searching time also in different countries where it took until I could finally find this employment at the European Space Agency. If I could give you an advice for the job application procedure, set yourself apart in two uh, essential assets. First of all, see yourself as a future colleague for those who interview you, as well as those who may finally make the decision of hiring you. The part here is that all of those other people have a great knowledge of, uh, as in your competitors, have a great knowledge of the law itself as well. But present yourself as a colleague, someone who those people interviewing you will want to work with for five days a week. And I think this will give you already a great edge. And then finally, and you will probably hear this often, really research the position you are applying for. Meaning, if it's a company, what do they do, look at the news, even if you think it's not related to your potential job uh, position. Know everything that they do. If it's an organization, get to know their legal frameworks a little bit. I think that, if you can cite it in the interview and apply it relevantly, of course, uh, will possibly set you apart from other applicants. Overall, the program here at the Hague University of Applied Sciences that you're following right now will certainly prepare you well for all of those steps and I'm sure that you will be well prepared to well either have a master program or uh, enter the job market. With that I will leave you to enjoy the rest of the day. Good luck with your studies and thank you. Dear members of the law faculty, honorable guests and students, um, greetings to you all from Lithuania. I hope everyone is well and healthy. Uh, we are facing a truly extraordinary situation at the moment, so I wanted to thank the organizers of the employment networking event for this wonderful occasion to connect and share our ideas. Um, first of all, a little bit about myself. Um, I am Kamila Sokolovskaita and I graduated from the Hague University uh, with a bachelor's degree in international and European law back in 2015. Um, right after graduation, I went back to Lithuania and worked as an assistant to Shirley City Mayor. It was a very interesting work experience because it combined um, a variety of subjects. Um, also, based on my international background, I got the chance to work with the municipality's uh, diplomatic relations. And last, but definitely not least, um, it was an eye-opening chance to see the interaction between law and politics. 
Um, after almost two years at the municipality, um, I was offered the opportunity to join the Lithuanian Paralympic Committee as the head of projects. This was both professionally and uh, personally a very valuable experience. Together with the team, we developed new strategic goals and initiatives that help empower people with disabilities through sports. And uh, recently, I decided to take upon a new challenge and started working as the head of projects at a communications agency. From my previous work experiences, there are a few takeaways and recommendations um, I would like to share, particularly with the people who are currently studying. And um, first of all, uh, work hard. Now, I know it may sound as a cliche, but your work is the best recommendation letter you can get. And it is not about the number of mistakes you make. It is more about doing the best that you can at that moment in time. And it may not be your dream job or internship, but every experience counts and builds on your current set of skills. And on a personal level, it makes you more resilient and ready for new challenges. Um, in my case, um, all the job opportunities were actually offered to me, so it was primarily my performance that stood out to the potential employer. Um, another advice that I wanted to share uh, is always stay curious and don't be afraid of change. Uh, when I look back at 2011, uh, the year I started studying at the Hague University, um, I had a very different career path in mind. But interestingly, I feel that right now uh, I am exactly where I wanted to be because I always followed my curiosity and tried to push myself out of the comfort zone. Um, I strongly believe that it was my law studies that helped me navigate through these different fields of work because with law, it is not only the knowledge that you take in while studying, uh, it is also the way of thinking and problem solving that prepares you for real life challenges, um, one of which we are all going through right now. So this is the end of my short message to you. Uh, thank you once again for this opportunity to share my thoughts and experiences. Uh, stay safe and healthy. Take care. We reached the final part of this event. Now we're looking forward to meet you at the Employment Network event next year, which also marks its 10th anniversary on the 21st of May 2021. My colleague, Mr. LaRange, also shared with you some activities next week on study orientation with more than 25 universities where our students did their post-graduation. Many thanks and greetings from The Hague for watching this ceremony. Take care and stay safe.